Hello again. Welcome to our next speaker, next talk. Uh, who of you actually has a crypto wallet? Raise your arms. Okay. Who's Bitcoin billionaire but lost his private key? <laughs> Shawik, of course. That's why you're here, right? Still working it. Okay. No, but like honestly, whoever lost access to their wallets, be it for shitcoins, NFT. Oh, okay. That's a few, actually. Interesting. So it's actually a relevant talk. Amazing. Please welcome on stage Costas from Sui to introduce us how to actually not lose your private key or if it ever happens, regain access. So please appear and big round of applause, please. Thank you, everybody. I have it on. So I'm Costas. Uh, many of you know me from uh, like yesterday's sessions. Um, I'm now Sui. I used to be at Facebook for uh, about three, four years, leading the cryptography team. I, jo I joined Facebook after Cambridge Analytica. Um, <laughs> so this was actually one of the key elements when they hired uh, back then on the Libra project at Facebook, cryptographers and people in security. How do we solve this problem of losing my key? And then I have some issues where, how do I recover it? There are also regulation issues here, and I will explain about this stuff. So they assigned it to us to find the solution. We found many ideas. Some of them are applicable today. Some of them require modern blockchains to apply solutions. But you will see there is a possibility in the middle of this uh, presentation that it is possible if we do something which is uh, acceptable by many, at least governments, and even like people who own uh, Bitcoin and crypto. There are three papers, if you are uh, like interested to look about them. This is the reactive key loss protection in blockchains. You can even get back your account, even if you didn't have MPC, even if you never had someone having a copy of your key. Technically, it is possible, and I will explain this. It's one of my papers as well. I will explain how it works here. This was 2021 in financial crypto um, in, uh, in that work, so it was probably the, the best paper according to the, to the judges. There is another one, very new CCS publication, ACM, one of the best uh, crypto conferences in the world, Interactive Multi-Credential. It explains how multi-sig wallets are better compared to the regular wallets, and sometimes we have some misconceptions that a two out of three wallet is probably better than one out of three, maybe for security, but not for recovery. You know, it's, it's quite complicated sometimes. We need more security, but we also want recoverability. And the other one, um, I'm very actually happy about this work. We did all of the analysis for whatever blockchain uh, wallet exists out there. It's an SOK, which means a survey, and it tries to figure out what most people are planning to do in the industry to recover the keys or having a backup and all of these things. As you can see, one of the co-authors is Aniket Kate, who is also the author of KZG, the commitments in Zero Knowledge. Um, now, this is the problem statement. I lost my key, I have no backup, and there is another uh, like twist here. Sometimes we might even send something to a wallet that doesn't exist, just because we mistyped. Imagine you have an IBAN, somehow you manage to make two, three changes on the IBAN, still it works, and for some reason this account doesn't belong to anybody anymore. The same thing is with addresses, right? People have all of these hexadecimal big numbers, it's very easy to make a mistake. Can you even recover from these situations? Is there anyone who says yes on, on this? Today you mistyped the address. Nobody has this address. Can you even recover the funds? You sent $1 million. Let's... You can the yes, you can fork the chain, of course. <laughs> it, happened. it happened in the past in some cases, like uh, with attacks on Ethereum in the past with the DAO case. But yeah, let's see now if it is, uh, if it is even possible. What is, uh, what is interesting here is uh, we don't care about your wallet being compromised, because if some attacker has access to your key, obviously they can go and transfer the funds. Right, this, there is no protection against this attack. It's, they have the same power with you. And um, uh, if I send to an existing address, this means that the person who received to a wrong existing address, who has this address, they can also spend the money. It's the same, pretty much the same issue. This is not the goal for this presentation. So, no, now, we have a few examples from the past. This guy lost 7,500 Bitcoin back then, and he asked for uh, like the city council 
to dig, like to excavate in the place where the trash is going to go and find the, the hard disk. Uh, imagine how much this is today with the current price of Bitcoin. Like 5.5 5, 5, 5, uh, thousand, right, Bitcoin. And so it makes sense sometimes to invest, oh, let's try to figure out in the trash or in, in this uh, uh, like uh, situation, it probably makes sense even for a insurance company to take the effort. Um, the other thing is happening because people are sending to the wrong chain. So I have someone from Sui sending to something, I don't know, in another blockchain that the addresses are the same. And then there is no recovery because this address doesn't exist in Sui. The same can happen between, I don't know, Bitcoin and Ethereum. The other problem is many people are forgetting their passwords. So this guy had, a, I think, um, hardware wallet. They tried the password a couple of times and they only had like one more time to do it you have to find a bug or something to bypass the, the hardware wallet security here. Um, same thing with mistyped addresses on Ethereum. It happened in the past, and I will try to figure out, to, to explain to you how Ethereum tried to solve it. They didn't apply it eventually, but it's a very, very good idea. And for many of us, including myself, at the very beginning, since I was also in the industry uh, on 2010, very early, we didn't believe that Bitcoin is a thing. We believed it's a game, so we had some keys, and the keys went, are never stored. And uh, including myself and Mike Han, who used to be like one of the first developers of Satoshi, I was very lucky to work with Mike. Uh, he also lost um, too many Bitcoins because he didn't, he didn't expect this to, to be a thing like in, in reality. Uh, there are many notable examples. I would personally focus on the one which is, as I see on the top right, we don't have a solution where a new generation of the blockchain, people eventually, um, the, there are some incidents happening in life. How do we transfer money to our people, to our family, to our relatives, if we pass away? And how do you have this regulation? You know, crypto is classified as an asset in the industry, you know, we have regulations. If we don't solve this problem of transferring fortune because someone doesn't have access to the key, eventually there will be a constant deflation on the, on the blockchain assets. Because every year, some keys will be lost, and again, and again, and again, and again. There might be, I don't know, 50, 100 years that there are not uh, any more coins in the circulation. Solutions. So the existing solutions are the following. We have the cold storage. Cold storage means that I have a backup somehow um, uh, on my vault. I probably have written it down to a paper, and then I somehow hide it in the room. Yes, this can work. The other one is custodial services. You go to someone and you, say, you tell them, look, you have to keep this key on behalf of me. Distributed keys and multi-signature is pretty much the same. Instead of having one key, you might have two out of three, and then some protocols and some blockchains do allow plain multi-sig. Literally, you have three keys on the chain, and then you say only two of them are required to be active to sign a transaction for my transaction to go through. This is better for recovery. Still, we have a problem. Imagine if two of them are lost for some reason. And then we have uh, some other things. I would personally focus here on the, on the donation DAO of the, of the Ethereum. So what Ethereum tried to do for a few people who mistyped addresses of the receiver was the following, which is very interesting. If I go to an address and I claim, look, I don't have the key for this address, but I do have the key for an address which is very, very similar, and it only differs in one particular digit. The probability in cryptography to find the key of another address with just one digit in difference is very, very small. Typically, you cannot do it, do it with today's computers. This means that they created a DAO. And probably you can say, if I can prove to you that I have a key that is very close to a particular address that hasn't moved the money for two, three years, can you give me the money back? And then, if you see it cryptographically, the longer the address the more difficult the probability for someone to be able to find such a, a particular collision, then they said, hmm, maybe we can do it because technically to do it today, to find another key for a very close address is very, very difficult. So practically we can have some DAO tokens even in today's uh, systems or the modern blockchains can apply it, that if we see someone having a private key with some zero knowledge proof or something that is very, very close to another one, we give them the money back. So technically, for this problem, maybe we have a solution. The other thing is the, the idea we proposed back then to, to financial crypto. There is a protocol called Kelp, and there is a way, even if you don't have a backup, under the assumption that I will explain, with three transactions, to be able to get your money back. And how does this work? 
So the idea is on the fact that when we're losing the key, there is something that only the owner of the wallet knows. Do you know what is this? It's the final bold statement here. You're probably the first person to know that you don't have access to the key. Right? And can we use this as an advantage to be able to recover the, the account? And the reality is maybe with some protocol you can do it. Uh, and how does this work? It's a commit, reveal, challenge, uh, very interesting situation. You literally go to the blockchain, this is the first star at the top, and you are committing that you lost your key. You literally say you hide it on the blockchain, hey, this account lost the key. Obviously you have to send it from a, a new address so people don't understand what exactly, who requested for the key to be recovered. Nobody knows again, like who is, who is committing. Now you wait until you see the transaction on chain. You check if this is finalized, and now you reveal the commitment that you had before, and everybody knows that this particular address claimed a moment ago that they lost their key. Then you wait, maybe for months, even years. We've discussed with a few custodians and regulations on this. If nobody challenges you in two years, you can go and get the money back. So practically, if you have a monitor, you have a wallet, and you check the blockchain every year, is anybody challenging my account? Now you have some protection that in theory you can use the kelp protocol to get back to your account. Obviously, you have to wait for a long period of time because we need to, to, to inform the user that who lost the key that it is possible to recover all of your amount of money back to a new address. And this is called the kelp protocol because it's called key loss, um, reactive key loss protection. Literally, it's reactive. I didn't have a backup. I didn't have an MPC. Nobody else had a copy of my key, nothing. Literally, I went to the blockchain and I claimed I lost my address. There are a few things that we have to be careful with that stuff, but let's see them, right? There are some time periods that we have to wait and some fees that we have to pay. We don't want people to go casually and claim other people's money. If a claim is false, you're losing the money that you uh, invest as insurance. So when I go and say, I lost my money, I also commit some percentage of my wallet balance, and only if the claim is true, then I get it back. If someone does it on behalf of me, they want to cheat on me, and I sign one transaction, so I prove the blockchain, the blockchain key for this address was never lost, I get your money, I get this feedback to me. So technically, if I'm monitoring the chain, people might try to bluff and take the money from me, and I'm also bluffing that I'm committing I lost the key, and I get the fees. Right, so this can happen, and this is literally a, um, a game you can play with attackers. There are many considerations. For example, the first one, at the moment it doesn't exist on Bitcoin, it doesn't exist on Ethereum, can be optional. Is it the default feature for the modern blockchains? Do the governments want it? Because, as I tell before, even if you put on your wheel, I'm transferring this money to my kids, there is no way they can transfer your money because they don't have your key. Maybe it's fine to wait for two, three years to do the claims, and maybe we can even have the people like a whitelist and allow list that I added here, who can claim? It might be governments, it might be some DAO, it might be entities that we might decide that are decentralized enough. It might be a list of custodians, all of the custodians in the world, like two thirds of them. So practically now we can have customizable camp parameters to have this thing actually being implemented. With the previous addresses like the Satoshi one and if Satoshi is not in life anymore, we have a problem of course, right? How do you do it with them? But with modern blockchains, we can all do all of this stuff, and we're planning to also apply some of these techniques in SUI. And now we can allow recovery for people. What we need is monitoring on the wallets, because some people forget their wallets forever, and they don't have any monitoring tool. You need to know. Or you can set your limit where, until you can receive uh, things uh, like uh, alerts that your, your address, someone is claiming your address. And also, there was a consideration about the fees. Shall the fee for the attacker be big or small? The attackers might not have incentive to attack in a, in a mass like uh, attack many users. So we also need wallet support, as I explained before. And anyway, people are very uh, fond of having this solution eventually in the blockchain because at the moment nothing exists. We will see, obviously, you have to talk to multiple entities about the new blockchains having the ability to do that or with account abstraction now, blockchains can actually have it as part of a smart wallet uh, uh, application. There are extensions, um, 
You know, sometimes, as I said before, I can fake transactions that I'm losing the keys just to receive, uh, uh, like some, uh, like I can claim to Twitter, oh, I lost my account. Some people will try to do the kelp, and then eventually they will go back to me. They will try to claim my address, and then I will say, mm, you tried to claim my address? Okay, give me your fee because I can sign a transaction. I never lost the key. So people can play this, this particular uh, game here. Um, attack vectors, as I said before, there are a few situations that we have to be very careful how we apply these techniques because someone can come with a gun in my head and say, look, I want to commit about your address, give me your key. Obviously, only if they kill you, you will not be able to claim your key in two years from now. But, you know, there, there is always uh, like the side effect. They don't know if your wife or someone else has a copy of your key. They can go and try to claim it and then someone else signs a transaction and now you lost your fee as well. So there are some protections here um, around this topic. I will ask for many questions about this. I know it's debatable if this is useful today and how we can apply it. Um, and that's all, that's the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take a couple of questions literally now. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. And there is one right there. Yes. As I explained before, you're right. Like the question is, um, what's happening with the current implementations that they don't have this kelp support today, right? How, how do you apply it afterwards? Is this the question? Well, the question is generally, where does the value, the, the tokens, the money come from? Oh, from the account that actually is not recoverable. You literally grab these funds from there and you send it to another address by the protocol rules. Yes, that's, that's why I'm saying this is probably the case for the modern protocols that are created or for new smart contracts that are using the account abstraction logic, even on Ethereum, where they can apply this as a, as a method of recovery. With the current embedded native thing on Bitcoin and Ethereum, probably it's too late. We cannot do this unless, because for, for some assets in real life, there is also this question, what do you do if nobody claims the money, nobody moves any money for 10 years? Some banks are closing your account and they can take your money. So maybe we can apply similar things, probably like making a very long period of 10, 20 years or something. And then this money can go, I don't know where, maybe to DAOs or maybe back to the community, back to the validators, who, whoever knows. It's all debatable, I agree with you. This is what we're trying to figure out now. What are the real parameters for this system? Thank you. Thank you. There was another one here. Yeah, Costa, thanks, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, I have two questions. First is that, uh, uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is the security trade-off? When you are considering this uh, scheme, what are the trade-offs? You are, you are giving up and then you are gaining. And, yeah. and then second is that, uh, uh, to reclaim that you need to send the transaction, as you mentioned, of course, nobody challenged the transaction. And who does this uh, send back the, the, the lost fund? For example, is the, the validator gonna validate that uh, uh, claim transaction and then if nobody challenged for 21 days and then you say, okay, the validator gonna artificially create a, a payload that, you know, using the- Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Great questions. First one is the attack vector, so the system. We have to- be careful on setting the parameters in a way that there are no censorship attacks. Literally, we have to delay the kelp transactions. We said commit, reveal, and then challenge. Setting these parameters is very important. And for every change, and, and based on the um, like threshold we want to set into the security of the system, you can set these delays uh, accordingly. The other is random testing. We have to prevent users go and claim addresses of all of the people in the world just because they know someone will have forgotten this. That's why we have to set the fee in such a way that is, let's say for example, 10%, you lock the money of 10% as a collateral for this attack. And if nobody claims the money, no, nobody challenges you, you get the money back. But you only have success on this if more than 10% of people um, uh, actually don't, don't claim their money, right? So you have to set the fee in a way that this attack, the random testing attacks cannot, cannot really apply. There is also the key distraction thing, like 
Uh, sometimes uh, we can, uh, this is very interesting, sometimes you can even destroy the key and then go and claim it on purpose. Uh, I don't know why should people do this. I know some people are gamblers and they want to do this just to avoid trading. It has happened in the past, I've seen it. And there are side channel attacks. So if someone knows your IP, knows that you have this wallet, and probably they can front run you even on the commit. These are the security uh, threats. So your second uh, question was, can you remind me? Yes, who is constructing the claims? So there are many solutions for this. It can be anyone. Or the fifth element here, add an allow list. The blockchain can have an allow list who, who can claim, and then it's part of the protocol rules. Literally, the validators. We get the money from this address, and we'll send it to another one. Or if it's a smart contract wallet, it's very easy because it's in the smart contract rules. So that's, that's the whole idea. So I think there was another one here, yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question. So uh, doesn't this uh, introduce like more attack vectors from the point of view that now, so right now on a blockchain, you cannot take from one address and send to the other. And after such a protocol will be imp implemented on the protocol level of the blockchain, then you, you have a way to do it, like a, a fraudulent va validator or so on and so on. Well, fraudulent validators can always do other things anyway, right? Uh, for, for other attack vectors, as we explained before, um, you have to take like the, the parameters being set in a mode where you can tolerate this, and also we can leave this optional, as we said. Like by the time you create your account, you can decide, do you want this feature or not? Or maybe you can even do the same thing in a um, like live way. For this period, I'm on holidays in Thailand, I want to enable kelp because I don't have access to my home, I don't have access to like uh, my values, and then maybe only for this period I enable it. It will depend how the, the industry will apply it, but I can see all of these questions are valid. Thank you. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, what's the best way for people to reach you? You stay on the conference or you're also heading home? I'm here Twitter? until two o'clock. Oh. I have my flight right after, but you can always reach me out in my email. I'm on uh, Costas Crypto, Crypto with a C. You can find me on Twitter, and the same thing is on Telegram. Awesome, and what percentage do you charge on account recovery? Nothing for me. I, I'm not getting anything. <laughs> I'm offering my service for free. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for that. Then Thank big you. applause, please. Thanks for appearing here.